what we see here in the very beginning. So look at verse number seven, 17. It tells us, so all the generations from Adam to David are 14 generations. And from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from... <clears throat> And from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. So that was right there, the genealogy. And that's the prologue. It begins, the introduction begins with the genealogy of Christ. Now here in verse number 18, we're actually going to get into the story of the birth of Christ. Look at verse number 18. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, that means in this way, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now, some people right there uh, will misunderstand the word espoused. And they'll, they'll uh, misinterpret that as saying that they were engaged. The word espoused means that they were married. It's referring to the fact that they were married. And when it says that they were espoused, that means that he was, that was his spouse. And they were one another's spouse. Now, the way to prove that... And this does this a few different times. Verse number 19, it says, Then Joseph, look at this, her husband. So, this is not just her fiancé. Like you've heard many people say. A lot of people will just say, hey, they were just engaged. And what the word espoused means is that they were engaged. That's not what that word means. When it says espoused, it means, it, what it's saying is, Mary was married. That's what that's saying when it says espoused. Mary was married to Joseph. And how can you prove that? Because in verse number 19, it refers to Joseph as her husband. Who's a husband? It's who you're married to. So people will have this weird interpretation, and I'm going to show you why it matters here in just a minute, of them just being engaged. But that's not true. They were married. And she, he's actually called her husband a couple of times in this chapter. But this is before they came together. That means that they have yet to have the relationship that a husband and wife have. They have not come yet together, right? They, they didn't know one another is another way that that's worded. It's actually worded that way in this chapter. So before they had come together, it says this, she was found with child of, that means like from, right? She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So now Joseph, of course, he knows that he's never had that relationship with her. He never knew her, right, in that way. And you know, obviously he's going to be wondering, like, why are, you know, why are you pregnant? Why are you showing, right? He's like, what in the world is going on here, right? Wouldn't you be wondering, like, what in the world is going on here? Look at verse number 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, so he's a righteous man, so what he did was good here, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Privily just means like privately or secretly, right? Now, what does the phrase mean, put her away? That's not just like using those words, you know, uh, in an in a, a, a individual sense of each specific word. The phrase, put her away, that's a phrase. And what that means is to divorce. It says that he was minded to put her away or to divorce her privily. Saying that he didn't want to make this a public matter. He wasn't going to make a public example out of her. You know, he was just, he was minded, what he wanted to do and how he was thinking that he was going to deal with such a situation was that he wanted to just put her away or to divorce her basically, privately or privately, right? Now, there's a couple of different interpretations of what's going on here. We'll go ahead and read verse 20 and then I want to hit on something. This is, we learn a really good lesson from this chapter when it comes to this subject. It says in verse 20, but while he thought on these things... Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, and watch this, thy wife. Notice, they're married, clearly. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So, while he's thinking, and he, he obviously, you know, uh, is thinking that, that she has committed, uh, you know, this act with another man at some point. So, he's sitting here contemplating, and he's saying, you know, she must have, you know, uh, uh, had this relationship with another man and now she's, she's with child. So I'm going to have to do something about this and the way that I'm going to go about it, he's obviously a just man, he knows the law, he knows, his, he knows his, uh, uh, his options. I can make a public example of her or I can put her away privately or divorce her privately. So he's like, that's probably what I'm going to do. While he's contemplating which option he's going to do, the angel of the Lord comes to him in a dream and explains to him exactly what happened. 
that this child is the product of the Holy Ghost, of her conceiving by the power of God and by the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, there's a couple interpretations of what took place in verse 18 and verse 19. And people have uh, you know, two responses to this and, uh, and, and to the whole situation of divorce. And this is one of the real important reasons why the book of Matthew, we need to understand that the book of Matthew is profitable for us. There's many people out there that are hyper-dispensationalists and, you know, you know, dispensational to whatever degree. Nobody wants to say they're the hyper-dispensationalists, but people that will go so far as to say like, hey, you can't get your doctrine from the book of Matthew. This, what I'm about to show you right now, is very important to help you understand and to demonstrate of why we can't just say, hey, there's certain books that you don't read. Because then there's things that we're lacking and information that we're lacking. You know, the Bible tells us that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So we can learn doctrine from all Scripture. Is this Scripture? Yes. Then I can learn doctrine from it. Case closed. Don't give me, you know, some sub point or some other note or anything like that. I can learn doctrine from it. I'm going to show you why it's very important because there's a lot of bad teachings about divorce today. There's a lot of bad teachings about divorce and there's, there's basically two responses. Number one is that you, should, you shouldn't ever get a divorce. And this is technically, you know, the true uh, 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 position, the correct position, is that there's never a time to get a, a divorce. Now, like I said, technically, because there is one exception, and it's the exception you're reading about right here. And we're going to go into this. Uh, there's one exception for when there's a time, according to the Bible, to get a divorce. No, God does not just have all of these different, you know, uh, uh, you know, options and ways to get out of being married. It's a vow. And the Bible is very clear about the importance of a vow. You know, let your yea be yea and your nay nay. You know, uh, the Bible says that it's better not to vow at all if you're not going to keep your vows. You know, so it, it's very important to keep our vows and that's what we do with one another is we, we stand up and we make a promise to one another and we vow to one another. The Bible says that God hateth putting away. It means God hates divorce. Think about that. God hates divorce. And it's a picture of your salvation, by the way. It's a picture of your salvation of when you were born again and you're born again into God's family. And it pictures how you can never, you can never be unsaved once you're saved. It's a covenant that you have with God and there's nothing that can break that covenant. It's the husband and the wife, right? That's this, and, it, and, it, and it symbolizes or parallels the husband and the wife on this earth as the relationship with the husband and the wife and God and us. So when, when you, you, know, you start you know, uh, messing with the sanctity of marriage and making all these exceptions of, to, oh, you can get a divorce for this reason, you can get a divorce for that reason, it destroys the whole symbolism of salvation and eternal security, of not losing your salvation and how it's forever and God will never lie, God will never you know, divorce us or put us away. That's one of the other reasons why it's, it's a very, very important uh, doctrine to make sure that we understand. So the correct response is, number one, there is, there's no options or, or no exceptions for divorce, but one, and we're going to look at it. So really, there's, there's no time for divorce. You could say that. And Jesus says that multiple times. The other response, you know, it can vary. Some people, everybody has their own reasons. They like to create their gray areas of, hey, well, this situation's a little bit different, or that situation's a little bit different, or this guy's just so mean, or whatever it may be. You know, you, well, you should have you know, been a little bit more wise before you made those vows. You know, it was your decision. But uh, those are the two options, basically. I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter number 19. Matthew chapter number 19, we're going to see in this very book that this is brought up, the subject of divorce, and Jesus teaches on it here in the book of Matthew. Look at Matthew chapter number 19, look at verse number 3. It says, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now notice what they said there. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, it says, for every cause? Like saying for any reason. Like, is it lawful for a man just to divorce his wife for any reason? That's what they're asking, for whatever reason that they want. And this is basically the other, you know, uh, uh, option, the other response to divorce. It says in verse 4, And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? Verse 6, 
Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now that's pretty clear, isn't it? So they're coming to him and saying, hey, you know, is it lawful to put away your wife for every cause? And then he just responds and says, hey, you know, from the beginning God made them male and female. For this cause, you know, man shall leave father and mother and cleave unto his wife and they too shall become one flesh. And then he explains, God's the one that did that. Therefore, what God hath joined together, let not man, you know, uh, uh, what does it say? How is it worded? Put, put asunder. Let not man put asunder. He's saying because God is the one that created this covenant, created this relationship between husband and wife and that they would come together and be one. Let not man get in there and, and, and you know, divorce his wife or she to divorce her husband. Don't let man put asunder and divide between them. And that's what divorce means. It means to divide, right? So he's saying don't let man do that. Then he says in verse 7, They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away. So they're saying, okay, well, if, they're, if you're saying, it sounds, you know, they're obviously understanding what he's saying. And he's saying, hey, there is no time for divorce, right? There's not a time for divorce ever. So they're like, okay, well, then answer this to me then. That doesn't make sense. They, they say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? Verse 8, he saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. Now watch this. But from the beginning it was not so. And again, that's referring back to the beginning when he made them male and female, right? And they, he joined them together. So let me just ask you, does it sound like God is okay with divorce? Even the exception that's in the law of Moses, God, it says that God put that there because of the hardness of their hearts, because they couldn't handle it, right? So he made this one small exception, and we're going to look at what it is, for them. But it says from the beginning it was not so. So what God's will would be is what? That there would be no divorce. That there would be no situation where in which a wife or a husband both could divorce one another. Now I want to go back to the Old Testament where this actual, where this one exception is given. And then we're going to compare it with Matthew chapter number 1 and just show you how the Bible is, is, is uh, meant to teach you doctrinally and how it's important that we have Matthew chapter number 1. I want you to go back to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter number 24. We're going to look at that one exception. The one exception in which a wife or a husband is, is uh, permitted to put away their spouse. It's Deuteronomy chapter number 24. It says in verse number 1, When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it says this, And it came to pass that she find no favor in his eyes. Watch this. Because he had found some uncleanness in her. So it's saying, at the moment that you marry her, right? And basically you go in under her. You've just married her. It says, and you find some uncleanness in her. Now notice this is something you're just discovering. So when is that going to take place? The very beginning. The honeymoon, if you will, right? The very beginning. And what does it mean, uncleanness? You find some uncleanness in her, right? This is obviously refer referring to, again, we've seen this a lot, the relationship between husband and wife. You know, there's a parallel passage to this where it talks about that he finds that the woman is not a maiden. Now, the word maiden refers to her being a virgin. So this uncleanness that it's talking about would be that this woman has had former relations. That she's not a virgin. So now, let me ask you this question. When that would have taken place, would it have been when... The, they were married or, or not married, prior to the marriage or after they were married? It would be before. Do you understand that? It's not taking place while they're married because he's finding out right away in the very beginning, in the honeymoon. Right? He's finding out, it says he goes in under her and he finds out that there's some uncleanness in her. Right? So, obviously, you know, this is occurring in the beginning and you compare it with the other passage when this is repeated and it's very clear it's happening in the beginning. So basically you find out this woman is not a virgin. That this woman is not who she, she said that she was. It's not a clean woman. Now at that point you're like, man, you have no idea what you're getting yourself into. I mean, she could be filled with disease. If she's lying to you about something like that, that's a pretty big deal. So keep reading. This is the, the one situation. Watch this. Because he had found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement 
and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. Now, let me ask you also another thing. Did it sound like that was public or that was private? What just took place? It was private, wasn't it? it? Was she made a public example? Did anybody else find out about this? Obviously, the next man didn't even find out about this. You know, uh, in, the, in the sense that he didn't go and tell everyone. I mean, it would have been her responsibility this time to say, hey, I had this in my past that happened in my past before she married another man, right? But this was not brought to just the whole city's attention. It was not brought before a board. This happened behind closed doors. It's very obvious. It says, because he had found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement. Notice this. And give it in her hand and send her out of his house. This is taking place between those two together. And it's privately, it's behind closed doors. It's privily. And it says, and when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And then it basically repeats the same thing. And if the next man hates her as well, you know, because he found some uncleanness in her, then he can do the exact same thing. Obviously, she should be telling these, these people. That's the whole reason why she's being divorced is because she's withholding, you know, you know vital information to your husband. I think that's something that he, you know, has the right to know, uh, husband and wife, of course. Uh, but go back to Matthew chapter 1. I want you to notice the, the striking similarity to the situation of what's occurring in Matthew chapter number 1. And Deuteronomy chapter number 24. Notice how they ju they're just married. They haven't come together yet, have they? And you know what? Joseph en ended up finding some uncleanness in her. She she's not as clean as he thought that she was. You know, apparently. That's how it seems at least, right? And he's realizing that she's with child. So notice what it says. It says that he was minded, look at it, to put her away privily. Do you know what he was going to do? He was going to get a bill of divorcement. He was going to write it put it in her hand, and send her out of his house. It's exactly what's recorded in, in Deuteronomy chapter number 24. What exception was the only exception that Jesus said was allowable in Matthew chapter number 19? This exception, right here. He, he referred to, you know, that he gave him one exception. Uh, Brother Rick, do you remember by chance where the other mention in the book of Matthew is located? To, uh, is it Matthew 10? Or Matthew, is it 9? Uh, the other mention of divorce and, uh, and putting away. Is it Matthew 12? Is it Matthew? No, uh, that's not the one that I was referring to. There's one other mention later on, I believe. Maybe it's in Mark. Maybe it's in Mark. I can't remember exactly where it's at. It was, I'd like to look at that real quick if we could. Um, look that up real fast if you don't mind. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll take that down and pause. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, there's one other mention where the Bible actually discusses this again, and you can look it up on your own. It's going to talk about fornication, right? Except it be for the cause of fornication is the phrase that's used. And what is fornication? Is fornication the same as adultery? Are those two things exactly the same? They're not, are they? Fornication is when one person goes to bed or lies down with they lie down with someone that they are not married to. Neither one of those two people are married. And, uh, you, you know, the adultery, the difference of that, it is Matthew 5. You're right, it's Matthew chapter number 5. Go to Matthew chapter number 5. We'll look at this in Matthew chapter number 5 real quick. I thought that, maybe I'm thinking of Mark. I think it's like Mark chapter 12 where this is repeated in the other gospel. But I want you to look at me at Matthew chapter number 5, and I want you to notice how this jives as well. So we can see this doctrine that's taught that divorce is not allowable. All these churches out here are, are, are teaching and promoting and deceiving people and making them think that God is, is okay with divorce. When the Bible tells you in the Old Testament that God or the Lord hateth putting away. God hates divorce. It destroys the sanctity of the picture of a covenant. It, it, you know, God hates when people don't keep their vows. It's a very, very, very big deal when people do not keep their vows throughout the Bible. You see a lot of bad uh, situations occur because people aren't uh, keeping their vows. But I want you to look at Matthew chapter number 5 with me and notice how this jives with everything that we've seen thus far. Look at verse 31. He hath been said, it hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife... Let him give her a writing of divorcement. So notice this phrase, putting away. It's always divorce, right? But I say unto you that whosoever, watch this, shall put away his wife, saving, that means except, for the cause of fornication, 
causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Let me ask you a question. How many exceptions does it sound like that God makes for divorce? Or putting away? One. There is not multiple exceptions for divorce. I don't care what you think. And let me say this as well. It's not adultery. Now, people may not like this. You may think that it's hard. Life is hard. And when you make a covenant, God takes it serious. God takes those vows serious. You need to actually mean what you say. And we live in a day and age now where people just don't mean what they say. And they think when something actually gets bad, they can just give up. You know, there's a reason why you stand up there when you make the vows and you say, for worse. What does that mean? Does worse sound like good or sound like really bad? Sounds like really bad, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound like it falls into the category of maybe unfaithfulness? Doesn't it sound like it falls into the category of maybe something very bad taking place between? He said, for better or for worse. Saying when things are going well, I promise I'm going to stay with you. But guess what else? When things are going bad, I promise I'm going to stay with you. And you know what? Nobody means what they say anymore. You know, that's, what we, that's why people you know, th think that this sounds crazy when they hear me say this. No, you're crazy and you're not loyal to your word. That's the problem. You have no integrity anymore. Nobody cares anymore. Nobody gives a flip about what they say. They'll just say, hey, I'll be there tomorrow. They don't show up. Hey, I'll call you, right? On Friday or Monday, they don't give you a call. No, nobody cares anymore. Time goes by and they're like, oh, you know what? I forgot about that. And they're just like, Pfft. Turn around and go the other way. No, it means something. God cares about it. God, you know, especially when he gives us promise, of course, the Lord cannot lie. He never breaks his promises. He's righteous. He's perfect. You know what? God wants us to also try to do the same. Hey, yes, you know, we are going to come short of, of the glory of God. But you know what? If that's a lot different than just like blatantly sinning, blatantly making decision. I know, making a decision. I know that I made a vow, but you know what? I can't handle this anymore. Life is hard. I don't know what you expected. Marriage is not perfect. Marriage is not perfect. You know, you're going to have rocky times. You're going to have hard times. And you know what? When you make the promise and you make the vow, you need to mean it. You need to actually mean for better or for worse. For better or for worse. There are no exceptions to divorce. I don't care if you get married and then you find out 10 years down the road, like, hey, I just feel like I don't love you anymore. For better or for worse. It's a covenant. For better or for worse. You know what you do? You work hard on your marriage. Marriage is hard work just like any relationship. Just like any relationship. What do you think it's going to be? Just like it's just constant bliss. Just like you're constantly on your honeymoon. Right? No. You ha it's hard work. Marriage is hard work. You know what you need to do? You need to fix it. You need to be an adult. You need to be mature and have some character and have some integrity and you need to fix your marriage. You don't just, you know, my husband or my, my wife, they're just developing these poor qualities and I just can't put up with them anymore. Or I've fallen in love with somebody else. You know, people, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side, right? People have all these reasons why they think that their life would be better and then, all, and then what do they end up doing? They end up, you know, leaving that person and finding out that they were actually pretty happy. Or they have these women, oftentimes that is, that is very common. Mother-in-laws, even father-in-laws sometimes with, the, with the, the, the husbands, but not near as common. Where mother-in-laws are like in the, in the, the, the wife's ear, like, like talking bad about the husband. That's super stinking wicked. And then she's looking down upon her husband. Or maybe like women are in the ear of, of the, the wife speaking bad. And then she'll ultimately, just for petty reasons, people will get divorces over stupid things. If it's not for fornication, then it's not acceptable to God. And He is the originator of marriage. He is the one that made male and female. He is the one that decides when it's alright to make that marriage null and void. And there's only one exception, fornication. That's not the same as adultery. And I'll prove it to you. It says, but I say unto you, verse 32, but I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving, watch this, for the cause of fornication. If Mary would have been unfaithful to Joseph in that situation, what would she have committed, adultery or fornication? Because she would have, been, she would have already been with child right when they were married, but they had not yet come together. What would it have been? Fornication. It would have been before the marriage. Notice, not adultery. Adultery is where you step out on your wife or your husband. They got married and then he found out there's some uncleanness in her. What did Deuteronomy 24 teach? 
If a man gets married, he comes in on her and he finds some uncleaner. He finds her not to be a maid and not to be a virgin. What would she have committed? What sin? Adultery or fornication? Fornication. So notice that it's not ten years down the road and all of a sudden you're like, oh, there's some uncleanness in her, I'm out of here. Oh, my wife's annoying. Divorce. She doesn't know how to cook. She's not getting any better. I'm out of here. That's not the uncleanness it's talking about. No, it's talking about you find out that she's not a maiden. This is immediately. This is fornication. This is the only exception. And look further. I'll prove to you that it's not, that it's talking about two different things. It says, saving for the cause of fornication, watch this, causeth her to commit adultery. Now, I want you to notice that it says, if you do it for any other reason, you're going to cause her to commit adultery. But if she had already committed adultery, how could you be causing her to commit adultery? So do you know what the fornication is? Not adultery. It's not possible. If you compare the two and you logically play this out in your mind, you can see very plainly and very clearly that when it says fornication, it actually means fornication. Because you would be causing her to commit adultery, meaning that, she, that it wasn't acceptable for her to commit adultery previously. Right? So, it's very plain that, hey, I'm sorry, but from the beginning, it's not so. You want to get a divorce? It's Jesus' words, not mine. From the beginning, it's not so. <clears throat> you know, the, the, uh, the Pharisees, they respond after Jesus is done in Matthew chapter number 9. And it's like, if the things be so, you know, that you're saying, then it is good for a man not to be married. They're like, man, if I just can't divorce my wife whenever I feel like it, maybe I shouldn't get married at all. You know, it's like they never had understood marriage and what it's supposed to be like, too. Can you, they're Pharisees. They're supposed to be the doctors of the law, the teachers of the law. They're like, if what you say is true, you know, it's good for a man not to be married. It's like, goodness sakes, what, how shallow are you in the first place to say, oh, you know, I'd rather not even be married than have to be stuck with one woman for the rest of my life. That's what they're saying. How ridiculous. You know what Jesus says? Yeah, basically Jesus is like, yeah, this isn't for everybody. It's a hard saying, I know. It's not for everybody. You know, that's basically the world that we live in today as well. Where people would just the same response. People would, you know what people would say if Jesus stood up and preached the same thing? The same thing the Pharisees said. Man, if that's really the truth of what the Bible teaches and everything, maybe it's just best if I just never get married at all. Because that's going to be hard to never get divorced. And Jesus would say the same thing. Well, hey, maybe, Mary, you know, maybe you're right. Maybe you can't receive this saying. Maybe marriage just isn't for you. Notice God's laws don't budge for you. He's just like, yeah, you know what? You're, it, you're right. Maybe, maybe you shouldn't get married then because this is a big sin. There are no exceptions for divorce and putting away. There are no real true exceptions when we really look at it. The only thing, the only type of situation, it's like it's this extremely rare situation. It's if you find out that she's not a maiden. Now that doesn't happen two years later. That doesn't happen three years later. That's something that you find out in the beginning on the honeymoon or very shortly, you know, shortly thereafter, and then you have this, this trial period of time, right? Because that's when you're going in and consummating the marriage, right? And there's actually, I can't remember what it's called. I think you remember this. There's a law, there used to be a law in the United States of America that gave you like 30 days after marriage. And it wouldn't be considered a true, like, a true divorce on the records. It, was, it, it fell under some other category. In the United States of America, uh, in the earlier days, I can't remember exactly what it was called, but you can look it up. It was a certain bill. And you were given like 30 days in the beginning where you could just null... It's, it, it's something about nullifying the marriage, right? It's nullifying or null, null something. Where you can just nullify it and it's not the same. You know what I'm talking about now? It's not the same as a divorce. You know where that comes from? It comes from the Bible. Like, where you get the opportunity in the beginning and then you find out, I want to, you know, it used to mean something to people whether you married a virgin. That used to mean, because people were actually virgins often. Now it's like, you, you can't find one, you know? But it actually used to be something important. It meant something to someone and when they were deceived and lied to, they're horrified. Can you imagine how Joseph felt initially? He's married this woman. He thinks she's a, she, she's a clean, godly woman, and she was. But then, you know, his mind, he's seeing she's pregnant. He's just like, can you imagine that? Marrying a woman, and you haven't come together yet, and a couple of weeks or two weeks go by, and she's pregnant. You realize that she's pregnant. 
Wouldn't you be horrified? Like you love this woman, you're expected to spend the rest of your life with her? Or, or just imagine finding out that a woman is not a maiden, not a virgin when you thought that she, were, she was and you are. You know, you're a clean, godly man that's wanting to raise a family and live a, a Christian life. You'd be horrified, wouldn't you? It's important. It means something. That is the only exception. The only. Saving for the cause of fornication. That's it. Look at verse 20. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter number 1. Real quick, we're going to fly through the rest of this. We'll be done in 10 minutes. Luke chapter number 1. I want, to look with, I want you to look with me at verse 35. <clears throat> Verse 35, look at verse 34 as well. It says, Then said Mary unto the angel, this is just some more details about what took place. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this, this be, seeing I know not a man? So, so she's a virgin and she's saying, How am I going to you know, bring forth this son, seeing that I know not a man? I've never come together with a man. I've never lied with a man. Look at verse 35, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon you. I'm sorry, come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. And then he says this, Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So as God is sending his Holy Spirit and miraculously causing her to conceive and to have a child. So that's what it's telling us in verse number 20, that this child is of the Holy Ghost. Basically saying that the, the Holy Ghost is the father of the child. The Holy Spirit is the father of the child. It's of the Holy Ghost. He fathered the child. Look at verse number uh, 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So the Bible will oftentimes define names for you as well. And that's what the name Jesus means. It mean, It's the name Joshua of the Old Testament. And you can, I don't have time to show you that right now, but you can do, it compares, uh, you can compare the Old Testament and the New Testament and it quotes the Old Testament speaking about Joshua and it uses the name Jesus in the New Testament. It's the same name. The name Joshua or Jehoshua is also another form of that name, means Jehovah saves. It means Jehovah saves, right? And that's who Jesus was. He was Jehovah in the flesh, and he came to save his people. That's why he's called Jesus. And it says he's called Jesus. Why? For, that means because, he shall save his people from their sins. He came to save his people. This is God, God coming in the flesh, being born in the flesh. Jehovah, he came to earth. He became a man. He became the Christ and the King to save His people. Look at verse number 22. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, look at this, which being interpreted is God with us. So what Emmanuel means is God with us with us. Jesus Christ was not just a man. Jesus Christ was not just, you know, uh, just a normal man or a divine man or maybe just a man, and people will say that a man that was just, you know, that was uh, miraculously created, right? People will, you know, uh, believe this when it comes to Unitarianism and things like that and, the, and adoptionism and they have all these, you know, these offshoots of ways in which people just try to deny the fact and deny the deity of God. The deity, I'm sorry, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was not just a man. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. That's why he's called Emmanuel. It says Emmanuel, which being interpreted, God with us. Do you know who Jesus was when he was on earth? He was God with them. He was with them. God came and God dwelled among them. The Bible cannot be any clearer. If the Bible is clear about anything, it's clear about the fact that Jesus Christ was God and that he was not just a man. 1 Timothy 3.16 says God was manifest in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. It wasn't just a man. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then it tells you in, I believe it's verse number 14, it says, And the Word was made flesh. Now, what was the Word? It says the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, 
and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So notice that it's very clearly telling you that the Word was God and the Word was made flesh. Who is the only begotten of the Father? Jesus. You know, over and over and over again, there's so many passages. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 that Jesus was the Lord from heaven. You know, Jesus is, is uh, omnipresent. Jesus is worshipped. Jesus is bowed down to. While God says don't bow down to anyone else, Jesus is referred to as Lord. And be like, yeah, he's Lord, but he's not God. Thomas looked at Jesus after he had resurrected and he said to him, my Lord and my God. And you know what Jesus said to him? Blessed art, art thou, Thomas. Same as a good thing. He's blessed. Jesus Christ was God with us. He was not just a man. He was God in the flesh. What an amazing story. There's nothing more amazing and incredible than the gospel of God coming down and being born as a man. To redeem and to save his people. Because he loved them and cared for them. It's an amazing story. It tells us in verse number 24... Then Joseph, being raised from, the sleep, did, from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now there in verse number 25, it's a perfect verse to turn Catholics to, to debunk the teaching of the perpetual virginity of Mary. Notice that it says, he knew her not till... She had brought forth her firstborn son. What does that mean? He knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. It means after she brought forth her firstborn son, he knew her. Till that time. Then he knew her afterwards. Right? Well, also, another point. Why does it say firstborn son? If, what would you say if I walked in and I only had one child with me? And you were like, hey, how you doing? You know, Pastor Baker? And I said, hey, I'm doing well. I shook your hand and said, hey, this is my firstborn. What would you be thinking after that? Would you think that that's my only child? No. I wouldn't say firstborn if I had only one child. Firstborn is to distinguish between the ones that were born after it. I would say this is my only child. So you know what it's saying when it says, and he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son? Saying he knew her after that, right? After she brought forth her firstborn son, he knew her after that, and then she brought forth other sons. That's the point. Other children. And the Bible talks about Joseph and, you know, all these other brothers that he has. You know, Jesus, that is. Jesus had, you know, Jesus had half-brothers. Isn't that interesting? Jesus had half-brothers on this earth that were born from Mary on his fleshly side. You know, obviously not on the spirit side, but on the fleshly side, in the blood. You know, so... One other point that I want to end on, just to give you an application, you know, because I went on a little bit longer than I wanted to tonight. There's a lot in Matthew chapter number one, excited about it. The other point that I want to make to give you an application is this. A moment ago, we looked at the genealogies. And one of the things that we saw uh, uh, was that we found a bunch of women and a lot of uh, kind of unexpected characters that were in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Tamar, not very godly as far as what we were told, right? We don't know about what happened in her life later. Rahab, which is who? Just like Achaz, it was, it was Ahaz. So how would you pronounce that? That'd be Rahab from the Old Testament. So Tamar, you have Rahab, you have Ruth, a Moabitess. So Rahab the harlot, Tamar the harlot, Ruth the Moabitess, this isn't looking good. Then you have, you know, it doesn't even name her name. It says, you know, Solomon, who was born from he, she, uh, her of whom was... The, uh, previously married or, or was the, the wife of, it says, the wife of Urias. Drawing attention to what? The fact that she, Bathsheba, committed adultery with David. Notice these people that are married, that, or that are mentioned, I'm sorry, these women that are mentioned. They're not mentioned in a good light, and yet they're still where? In the line of who? The Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's a couple things that we can learn from that. Number one, this idea that there's like this perfect race, like this perfect genealogy, and like the Jews are perfect, it's just like, you know, there's so many different sides. You have the black Hebrew Israelites are like, no, we're never intermingled with anybody, although it seems like you've never read the book of Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah. I mean, that's what the whole book is about at the end. You know, but uh, even within the line of the Christ and the Messiah, there's multiple people that are not of the Jewish line immediately. Like who? Rahab the harlot? Like who? Ruth the Moabitess? It's like, 
that tells you right there, like, hey, God doesn't only care about one kind. That's why Jesus, when he was ascending into heaven, just prior to that, he said, Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. In Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. God loves everyone just the same. doesn't matter, you know, whether you're black, white. That is irrelevant. That has nothing to do with, you know, whether or not God loves you and cares for you. God can use anyone of any nationality. That's irrelevant. The nationality is irrelevant with how, you know, God can use you. But not only that, God can use you even though you may have a bad past. And a lot of people don't get into church because of this sometimes. And they don't get into serving God because, they, because of things that they had done in their life. I even know people that don't get saved because of it. And they even, and this person ended up getting saved, but they understood the gospel. They even said, like, I know all I have to do is believe. He's like, but just everything that I've done in my life in the past, it just, it, it's just too hard for me just to, to, to put that away and to even just put all my faith in Christ. So it, just, it, just, it, just, it just bothered him and made him feel too guilty. You know, and sometimes people may think like, hey, I just can't change my life. I've went on too long down this path. Or I can't be used of God. Look at what family I come from. Look at how poor I am. Or look at all of these different things. You can be used by God. If Rahab the harlot can be used by God, you can be used by God. You know what it, it, it does? It gives you no excuses. Look at the people that are in the line of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the line, and they were used to bring forth the Messiah, the Savior of the world. The King of the world. Who was it? Rahab the harlot. Look at, it's, it's this, and the same is true if we look at the, this principle with Jesus in his life. You have Mary Magdalene, out of whom he cast seven devils. You have fishermen that he brought and used. You have Matthew, who is a, a tax collector. The publicans were known for ripping people off and doing mischievous things, deceitful works with you know, money and things like that, just like you know, every government that's ever existed. But you know, they could still be used by God. So you have no excuse. That's what we learn from those genealogies. You say, all oh, these genealogies don't help me anything. You learn things from those genealogies, a lot of stuff. And yeah, it may be a little bit deeper and take a lot of time to study it and things like that. But you know what? We need to delve into these things and learn things from these. We need to not skip over the genealogies. Read them. And then you'll start realizing, oh, I know these, these stories a little bit better than I thought. I know who these people are. And then the whole, pu the whole puzzle starts to come together much clearer of the, the timeline of what took place. Now, so notice that chapter number one, what, do we, what is this about? It's about the king of the Jews. That's what it's about. And the whole, the whole book is going to follow that same line where it's a very Jewish book. And I want to end on this. You notice that the very end, what did we see happening? We saw a prophecy of the Old Testament being fulfilled. A prophecy that the Messiah would come. The Old Testament scriptures, that which was committed unto the Jews, we saw that being fulfilled. And we're going to see that discussed a lot. There's a lot of scripture from the Old Testament being fulfilled, which was the Old Testament pointing towards the Messiah to come. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, uh, uh, dear Lord, for the Christ that he came. We thank you for the genealogies. There's so much that we can learn, that they're so clear, and all of the different uh, resources that we have within the Bible that we can compare Scripture with Scripture, dear Lord, and, and grow in knowledge. Uh, create in us a zeal and a, and a desire for, for, for more wisdom from your word. And uh, give us understanding and enlighten us through the Holy Spirit. We love you. ask you that you keep us safe tonight, dear Lord. And uh, continue to bless us. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 Alright, let's open up our hymnals. Last song for the evening. Let's open up to 147. Song number 147. <clears throat> Song number 147, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Song number 147. <clears throat>